um, in honor of dads, you know dads are, and, and uh, dads, we're, we're just unique, right? We're a unique breed. We say things that uh, you just have to be a dad, right? And everybody else, like dads thinks it's funny. Everybody else cringes in a little bit. I mean, right? And then like you, you, you cringe and then uh, kids one day, if you know, Guys, you become a dad, um, well, then you'll be doing the same thing, I promise. And you just, like, it's the funny. I want to read some real dad texts, real dad texts between, between dads and their kids. So if we just, we just kind of throw one up. Dad, there's a moth on the outside of the bathroom door. Can you get rid of it? Please hurry because I'm going to cry. Dad, dad, dad is dead. You're next. Love, you're next. Love moth. <laughs> That's great. I love this dad. I don't even know who he is. Could you pick me up? Why? What happened? The teacher pointed at me with the ruler and said, at what end of the ruler, at, at, at the end of this ruler is an idiot. And I asked, which end? So I got suspended. Ha, ha, ha. You're awesome. Not even grounded. Like, I don't know. I'd be that dad. Trying to wish you happy Father's Day, but your phone is off. Oh, gosh. Happy, uh, unhappy Father's Day. You remembered. Yes, I may be your least fave child, but I have the best memory. I don't have favorite, uh, a favorite child. I dislike everyone equally and each in their own special ways. <laughs> That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. That's great. Parenting win, I guess. I don't know. This could be horrible. I don't know. Uh, what do you want for your birthday? A girlfriend that's not crazy. You should ask for something more realistic, like a dragon. <laughs> Good dad. That's great. Okay, I think this is the last one. <clears throat> yeah, I wasn't able to make reservations at the library. There. Don't say it. Completely booked. <laughs> Is there one more? I think I had one more. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's the difference between a piano, a tuna, and a pot of glue? I don't know. You can tune a piano, but you can't piano a tuna. <laughs> he, 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 what about the glue? I knew you'd get stuck there. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Again, you know it's dad stuff because like most people in here cringed and the dads are like writing it down. Like, oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I can totally use, I can totally use that one. Hey, we're still in the series called A Faith That Stands. And the whole idea and the principle behind this entire thing, I want to I be able to live my life in such a way that no matter what happens, what hits, what comes against me, I can still keep standing. I, everything around me may fall, but I have something deep inside that I'm standing on, that I'm standing with, that I don't fall when everything else does. And that, that, that comes from having a faith that stands. And I think if we're really truly honest, maybe we could all wrestle with this question, like what kind of faith do we have? Do we, do we truly have the faith that no matter what happens, stands against anything, or does it kind of just stand occasionally? And when I really ask myself that question, I don't always like the answer that I come up with. And so I want to I have a real faith, a real life that stands against anything. And we've been looking at this verse every single week. It's in 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 13. And we've been looking at the NIV version. We're going to look at a couple different versions today so that we can get maybe a broader context of a part of it. And it says this, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous and be strong. Be courageous and be strong. Like today I'm feeling strong, right? But it's like dad weed eater strong because I was like weed eating for an hour yesterday. I'm like, man, I feel like I've been working out, you know? Like I haven't. I just weed eated. But it's a, big, it's a big deal for me to be sore, right? Like I'm working out. Okay. Some of you work out all the time. Uh, I just weed eat. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, the ESV says it this way though. It said, be watchful. Like watch out. Be looking. Stand firm in the faith. And look, look how differently this one translates it. Act like men. Be strong. Act like men. Right. Another way you could say this, and I'm sure you've probably heard it this way before, is like, come on, man, man up. Man up. Man up. Now, this phrase, man up, is something that I usually heard whenever I was a teenager uh, connected with something potentially harmful and dangerous. Right? Like, don't be a chicken. Like, you're rolling your bike up to this ramp that somebody built that you know has no building skills. This rickety, horrible, dangerous, you know we're all going to die on this ramp. But it's like, it's across, like, the, 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 where the water flows in front of your house. What's that little called? Okay, whatever. And, and we're going to jump over that. And we're like, come on, man up. Don't be a chicken. And so we all jump over it and then... You know, at least half of us break or bruise something really badly. Anybody else have the, man up, man up. You can, you can, when there's a hot pepper in front of you and everybody at the table is a little bit scared to eat it, come on, be a man. Man up, eat the pepper. Like, whenever I'm in school and like, you, you want to go talk to this girl over there, right? But 
you know, you're a little too scared, and all of your friends tell you, come on, be a man, man up, go, go, go talk to her. And I'll walk up to her and make, her think, make them think that I'm really, and I'm just asking her what the time is so they'll leave me alone, right? That was the kind of uh, suave guy I was in high school and junior high. I am lucky to be married, people. I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> Doing everything I can to make this marriage great because I know, I know how lucky I am. Oh, man. Act like men, though. Now, um... A lot of people have done a lot of stupid stuff probably on the other side of that phrase. Act like a man. Man up. Now, when you, when you read this and you think about it, why was this used here? And, and as I kind of research and look at it, this is, this is something written to the Corinthian church by this guy named Paul uh, to encourage them, to correct them, to help them. Uh, and, and it wasn't an accidental phrasing that he used. It wasn't, wasn't by... Just accident, he used this phrase that was act like a man. Now, there are a couple of different translations, and we saw that, right? The NIV says, be courageous. In the ESV, it says, act like a man. But actually, I think it's when you put both of these together, we get a clearer picture of what this original word meant, a clearer picture, because the Greek word, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I would just make a fool of myself. The, the, the root word is A-N-E-R. You pronounce it however you want to. Uh, that's, the, that's the root Greek word used in this word right here for act like men or for be courageous. And it's very clearly defined as something that is both masculine and mature. It's meant to be something where he's saying, man up. Like, right, like he, he's, he's saying, man up. Act like men, man up. It's on purpose. He says it this way for a reason. It differentiates gender, but it also differentiates from like a boy to a man, all in this one little word, act like a man. A-N-E-R being the root word. Now, see, I have an okay uh, deal, and a lot of guys do with the gender part being a guy, but it's the growing up part that like I struggle with. I was talking to somebody the other day, the only difference really between a junior high boy and a grown man is a beard. Like that's pretty much it. Ladies, y'all mature. Like y'all do. Y'all, y'all, y'all like, unless you're Noah, he had one in junior high. <laughs> like uh, he's right up here. Uh, but like the only thing difference is I may get a little bit taller and I get a louder truck, but I'm the same immature person. Anybody with me? The ladies, y'all like, I know, right? I know. That's why we get a kick out of those, out of those jokes that we, that we have. Some of them at home, I'm telling you, they're really good. They're really good. And one that, like, I thought was good, like, I didn't come up with it, but, like, you know, it's like, what, what do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef, right? I mean, I just, I was, like, laughed for, like, an hour on that one, and they're like, ugh. But, like, it's, it's both masculine and ma ma mature here. And I think it takes both definitions and both translations to get a really accurate picture. He's not saying, hey, be like a dude, right? He, he's, he's, he's not just saying that. He's, he, he's more saying, be courageous and be bold and be strong. Man up. Act like a man. Now, here's what's also interesting about this passage. This scripture was not just written to men. He was, he was saying this to the entire church. It wasn't, he didn't just turn to the men in the section, right, and say, okay, now men, he was talking to everybody and used this phrase actually for everybody. Guys, we gotta man up, right? We, 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 we've gotta, we've gotta, we gotta do, we gotta be courageous and strong if we're gonna stand firm in what God has for us to be. We gotta be bold. Now, again, Paul's not saying to be dude-like. He's not saying that, um, you know, burp or fart or have a, you know, grow a beard, ladies, or, or look like this. Here's a couple of pictures of some guys. You got that, George, back there? A couple of pictures of, uh, of, 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 of guys that maybe, yeah. He's not saying act like a man and do the dad pressed shorts with the new balance shoes. Anybody, like, that's, that's come on, that's classic dad. We, I think I have one more, right? Do I have one more? Let's click one more. I may not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like, act like a dad and have like this whole chain of keys. Anybody have that dad? Like the whole chain of keys that you were, and you have no clue what any of them go to, right? He's not saying like, just act like a, like a dad, like a dude. He's saying, man up, right? 
with courage and boldness and toughness and fortitude and strength. These, these, these words, these are attributes and characteristics associated with manhood and manliness, but not exclusive to men. Here's the caveat and the key. He's saying it like this because these are things I'm going to talk about in a minute that's not exclusive to men, but it's things that men we should be leading in. That men we should be setting the example in. I wonder if sometimes maybe man has got a bad, um, a, a bad rap lately because there's been bad role models of manliness. These are, there's some examples of what it means to be a, a, a man we're going to talk about in a few minutes. See, in, in this culture, in this day, to even hear a statement like this, for, to come into a group of people and say, man up, I mean, like, that feels like off-putting and offensive. And I'm probably going to get like, no, I'm going to lose all my followers on Facebook now because this is streaming live and I said that. In our culture, it can even be sexist or insensitive. How dare he say that? I'm sorry, I just read the Bible. Right? Like, how, how, how dare that? Because, again, I think it's probably because a lot of us, the example that we've had of, of men who have led, men who have been our example, have been a lot of times nothing that I want to do and sure nothing I want to be around. So what if maybe when we hear statements like this, it's off-putting to us or it makes us wonder, uh, could this just be a wrong translation? I wonder if we've just in, misunderstood what real God-created manliness is all about, what manhood really is. See, this is, gonna, this is from Paul, it's a challenge to men, but it's an example to everyone in a way that we can live and stand firm, in a way that we can have boldness and courage and be tough and resilient that no matter what comes at me, come at me because I'm still standing, right? I think some of us retreat and give up way too quick whenever we have the strength to stand. We have the strength to stand. I think a lot of the definitions that we have of manliness or manhood is really just cultural and generational and so often even a corrupted version of what it should be. Like... Should you have a beard or be, be clean shaven? Some people are like, uh, a man without a beard, that's just a woman, right? Like, I've seen that on Facebook. I'm not saying that's okay. Don't, don't like, throw, like, okay, I'm sorry. But like, that, that's some people's view. But you know what? Like, you go from decade to decade, beards are in, beards are out, beards are in, beards are out. I literally only have a beard because if I shave it, I look like a 12-year-old, baby, round, fat face, okay? Like, it just makes me look a little bit older. But, like, it's just generational and cultural. It's how we define sometimes man and do I wear boot cut jeans. Well, what if I came in here, though, and I was wearing, like, a plaid um, skirt, You'd be like, that's not, a, well, a, in a different culture, in a different time, that's manly. It's called a kilt. And somebody with a kilt, you don't tell them it's not manly because they will stab you. <laughs> Generational and cultural in a lot of the ways that we define, hey, should, should I have long braided hair or should it be cut short and parted, right? Again, I have my opinions, but there's different cultures, different times where a dude in a culture with long braided hair is the dude in the tribe you don't mess with because he will cut you and gut you, right? He is the manly. And nowadays, it's like it needs to be a number two, it needs to be over, or you're, it's not a man haircut, right? How much of how we define manhood is not really what is real manhood as it, as it really should be? Like there's so many different things that like, defines what a man should be able to do. You should be able to hunt and fish and live off the land. Like, if you give me a can opener and some SpaghettiOs, like, I can live as long as there's a supply of SpaghettiOs, but if I got to hunt and, like, I have to, like, YouTube how to take the fish off the hook. I'm just being honest, okay? Went fishing, there was nobody to do it for me. Just being real, I got some shaking heads over here. I'm sorry, it's just who I am, and I'm being transparent. You should be able to tear down an engine and put it back together and it run better than it did before if you're a real man. You should be able to shave your face with your knife because you keep it so sharp, right? Or maybe don't shave at all because that's, I don't, see, we don't even know. You should enjoy arm wrestling and the pain that it brings later. You should impress everyone with your incredible grilling skills. Like, these are real men. And here's what's happened, though. 
And here's what happens so often. As, as men and as guys, what we do is we compare ourselves sometimes to this list of other things, and it can make a lot of us feel uh, pretty discouraged. When I compare myself with a list that looks like I'm supposed to be manly, and I've got like two out of ten, I'm like, oh my gosh, at least I've got a beard. Yeah, I can't grill very good, and I can't, sure can't kill anything. I've got to go pick it up at the market. You know what I mean? And I called it market. That's kind of girly. Like, like, there's so much. It's like, man, so I, I, I live discouraged, and I compare myself, and I live down. And we had a conversation some, with, with some men even this week talking about how we compare ourselves to the examples of our dads and how they parented and how they lived. And, like, a lot of their lives, some of these guys struggled with, like, I'm not good enough because we defined it based on one definition of what manhood is. And sometimes manhood and manliness, honestly, has just been corrupted. Because even the idea of it, what you've seen as example, has been something that's domineering and abusive and angry, selfish, hurtful. And that's the example that maybe some of you have seen. And so the only thing that I have is like, I just know that what I don't want to be like. And that's our example. So society's best answer to this, because we've struggled with what it means to be a man, and I'm, and I'm going through all this, not to exclude any any person in here who's not a man, but to give us an idea of what biblical manhood looks like, so when we go back to the scripture and act like a man, we know what it really means. Not just grow a beard and wear a new balance, you know what I mean? Press your shorts. Don't, don't, don't iron your shorts if they're like, don't wear cargo shorts, by the way. Okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. I don't. I asked Jordan what style is. He's been in the back. So in our society, the answer is this to manhood. Here's, here's the answer. We push away anything that represents manhood at all now, don't we? You begin to look, and, 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 and so manhood is almost a dirty word. Being manly is almost this bad thing, and so it gets pushed away and pushed to the side. But what if instead of pushing away what it means to be a real man, we just get a clearer picture of what it means to act like a man in the image of God? What if we just got a clearer picture of what it means when he says man up as define what God means by man? To understand and be able to stand firm in this challenge that Paul gives, I think we've got to look at what real manliness is because we've like, so messed up this definition. They're like, I don't want to do any of that. Let's just change the translation. Let's look at the other version, not that one. But instead, I think we have to look at both. Godly manhood, manhood as God intended, how do we discover that? The greatest way to discover is by looking at Jesus, right? The, the, the God-man brought to this earth the Son of God in the very reflection of the Father himself. Why? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So by looking at Jesus, we can get a clear picture of what the Father is like. And the Father is the real example of manhood that we should pursue. And, 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 and the kind of life and the kind of manning up whenever we look through these different characteristics and attributes that we should try to emulate an example. The problem is, so often, we don't really have much of a picture of like a manly Jesus, do we? Sometimes. We, we don't, so here's a couple of pictures of some of the thoughts that we have on Jesus. Here's, here, here, here's, here's one of the manly, the manly pictures of Jesus. So, I mean, like, okay, go to the next one, and here's another picture of Jesus. Now, hey, I'm not hating on the artist. I'm just saying sometimes that's our definition of Jesus, and if we're really honest, sometimes we look at him more as a feminine character than anything manly. Right, Jesus wouldn't understand with grease under his nails and, and calloused hands. Well, I mean, Jesus was a carpenter. He was a fisherman. He was bold. He was tough. He was strong. He was powerful. Yes, he had the other side. He was completely balanced where he could be humble and he could be loving and he could be meek. But he also had the power and strength where when he walked into the temple and he saw some people doing something they weren't supposed to, he grabbed a whip and like, wah, knocked, hit the, at these people, ran them out of the place and flipped over the tables. Come on, that's what I'm talking about. It's like Israelite Rambo up in there. Don't tell me that's the full image of Jesus. Just like, 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 no, 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 no. 
I mean, calloused hands from building tables and benches and, and working with his hands and learning under Joseph, who was a, a carpenter, fishing. And, and man, he was, a, he, was, he, was, he was a guy, but also soft and caring. And, and so I'm going to look just for the remainder of the little bit of time that we have. I'm not going to read all of it, so don't get intimidated when I say it's two chapters worth. Like, don't be scared. Like, oh, my gosh, put your seatbelt on. Like, Mark chapter 9 and 10. Mark chapter 9 and 10, and I want us to read some of these scriptures. Now, this does not give us an overall view of everything, all men, of the example of Jesus. But as we look through, this, is, there's a lot of stories in here that gives us a great um, example of, of the kind of man that Jesus was. And if we can look at the kind of man that Jesus was, guys, we can look at the kind of man that we need to become. And everyone, we can look at the kind of person that we need to emulate and what it means to truly man up. Starting at Mark chapter 9, verse 33. He said, when he came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Because as they were walking into Capernaum on the road, he heard his disciples bickering and arguing behind him. Now in the house, he's like, hey guys, what was that about? What are y'all arguing about? He said, but they kept quiet. Because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Anybody else? Like, I'm a man because I'm stronger than you. I'm bigger than you. My dad could beat your dad up. Right, we started that stuff young. You know what I mean? They were arguing. These people who hung out with Jesus were arguing about, like, which disciple is the greatest? Like, Jesus loves me more. I could do more than you. And so sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and a servant of all. See, a lot of these examples of manliness, we're going to see what Jesus does. He takes the norm and the thought that we think that it takes, and he flips it on its head. So as a dude, we're like, man, I've got to be the best and, and, and have the biggest boat and like beat up the most people. Like, like, you know, like I've got to be tough and a little bit better than everybody else. But Jesus' example of a real man is somebody who's humble. Somebody who's humble. I'm not always good at that one. Somebody who it's not all about me all the time, but if we look a lot of times at what defines a real man, it's usually the definition of selfishness, right? Spend more time with me, do me, get my stuff, get, get this bigger and better. And the, the disciples, like us, feel more validated by being the best and having the better. And, and Jesus said, actually, um, right, you be the, be the least. Like instead of you stepping on people and, 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 and to do whatever it takes to get to the top, as you're on that ladder, you're reaching down and throwing other people over and helping them out. That's the mark of a real man. What if, all, what if everyone lived in this way? What, what if we parented this way? What if we were married this way where it's not about me? Literally, I'm living to make you better. I'm living to help you accomplish your dreams and to pull out all the God gifts inside of you. As, as you parent men and women, as you look at your kids, I'm parenting in such a way that it's not about me, but I'm going to draw out every God gift inside of you. I want to do everything in my job to make you better because I'm humble. I'm, I lift up others and I promote people. Mark the first mark of a real man. In, in, in verse 38, he goes on. He says, teacher, said John, we saw someone over here. They were driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop. Wanted Jesus to be proud of him, right? We told him to stop doing that because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. Here's the next verse. Flip stuff on their head. For whoever is not against us is for us. A real man is somebody who's compassionate and caring for others. To so the disciples, they were looking at this other person and they saw all the reasons why he didn't fit into their group, so wanted Jesus to knock him out. And, and here, what's our favorite statement? If you're not for me, you're against me. A real man, if you ain't for me, you're against me. You know what Jesus said? If you're not against me, you're for me. Flips it on his head. And he's looking and saying, how can I be for people instead of against people? But us, we look at ways to separate ourselves. They can't be with us. They're not like us. They're not as manly as us. They're not as cool as us. And, and, and ladies, we, we all do this. Students, we all do this. We all want to segment people into how they can't fit into what I'm doing, except Jesus says, hey, I'm for people. If you're not against me, you're for me. You're, I, it, it, whoever's not against us is 
for us. The disciples wanted to qualify people so they could fit. And Jesus said, people already are qualified. Right? I'm not trying to qualify somebody. I'm just trying to include and love somebody. People, a real man is caring and compassionate and looks at people through the eyes. But I'm for you. I'm for you. I'm for you. Let nine, 943, let's go on. Jesus goes on and begins to teach them about how to really live a godly life. And he says this, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Woo, how about that for preaching, right? I would imagine having like a saw from his carpentry shop as an example, right? Like preaching illustration. He said, it's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. Or it's better for you to enter life crippled to, than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, wouldn't you guess it? Pluck it out. <laughs> it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. He said, you want to be a real man. You want to be somebody who, who God is calling you to be. It's, per, it's a person who lives with integrity. It's a person who lives with moral control. It's a person who lives their life with moral discipline. Making an effort to say, I'm going to stand and do what's right even when it's not easy. Now, we say in big things like, oh, I've got this. But how about those small little business deals that nobody else will know about that will help you one up, but you know it's not right? Those small little things with our kids and wives and your husbands and all these different things that we do that we excuse away but we know it's not right. And he says, a real man of God, a real person who's an example to everyone else will do whatever he can to stay morally pure. That's hard. That's, a, that's, a, that's, like a, that's a stout. Like, if you want to be tough, be tough in integrity. Be an example to people, except the, the most manly thing that most of us can think of is like, wait until the weekend, I can't remember it on Monday, right? And that's our source of manliness, and instead, that's just the source of a wound for somebody else. Whenever a man of God says, I'm going to live with a moral discipline, and can I tell you, I don't always hit this mark, but with Jesus is my example, we, we're, we're determined to stand up for what's right, to do what's right, even when it's hard. A person of integrity, a mark of, a, of, of manliness as defined and exampled by Jesus. Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 2 through 9. It said, some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because of your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you that, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them man and female, male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Mark of a real man. So... Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bigger example than what we see just here. A mark of a real man is someone who's committed in life, who doesn't just give up. Now, why does he say this to them? Because they were just looking for a reason. They were just looking for a reason. In the Old Testament, they would look for whatever reason and just be like, okay, I'm done with you, be gone. And so he's like, so Moses permitted it, but he's like, that's not the way you're supposed to do. Just like, okay, I'm done now. It's like eating tacos. I'm finished. Right? But, but a real man is committed in life. So often, though, we're not committed to anything. You talk to me about dieting. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm about as committed as thinking about it for a second. And that's gone. I'm already thinking about Twinkies now. I mean, but it's, it's the example of truly being committed. Truly not just giving up. To, because like sometimes things in life are hard, and with guys, let's be the example that everyone can follow. That 
We're committed to what matters. We're committed to what matters. Some days, well, is it bad to say some days I don't like my job and I'm the pastor? Like, that's, that means maybe some days I don't like people. Um, <clears throat> some days I go to work and I don't enjoy it. Some days are hard. Those be people who are committed and not just look for a reason to quit. A real man is someone who's committed, so be committed. Be committed. Stand up. Like, be faithful. Show, show everyone else what it's like to be faithful. Faithful. Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 13, says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them and were like, get them kids away from Jesus. He, this is a busy man. He's like healing people and like he ain't got no time for little baby kids. He said, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He got mad at them. And he, he, he said to them, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive... Um, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like these little child will never enter it. Here's what Jesus was. And we see this over and over and over and over again. Jesus was extremely intentional with his time. He was never too busy for what really mattered. He was busy. He was healing people. He was doing, doing big stuff. And so like really important people, right? You wouldn't just want kids all crawling around. They got important things to do. He said, Jesus said, no, 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 no. I got time for what's important. I got time for what matters. It's actually these kids, they get it more than you adults do. These kids, their faith, they get it more than y'all do. Y'all struggle more. Like, y'all should be more like these kids. So he, and like, there's, there's another time where there's this lady who's got an issue of blood. She's been bleeding for years and years and years and years, and Jesus is her last hope. He's surrounded and crowded by people. She, he's on the way to go heal somebody else for an important guy. He's walking with somebody who's important going to his house, and this lady who is kind of, and this day would have kind of been nothing, touched him. Jesus stopped, turned around, pushed pause, and took time for her. A real man is never too busy for what matters. And it's so easy sometimes to be busy, 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 and then unplug, and then what matters never really gets any attention. Is that just me? And then I look back and be like, what really mattered, like, my kids, and what really mattered, like, some disciplines and what really mattered like people and what really mattered was the things that got neglected and you know like I want to excuse it because I'm doing it all for them while never spending any time with them right Jesus a mark of a real man is intentional he stopped and he said don't you dare push them away I have time for them I have time for them what do you have time for there's, there's, there's another, in the, in the last example we're going to look at, and there's example after example after example as you look at the life of Jesus. There's this one guy that comes up to Jesus, and he tells Jesus, he's like, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Like, I've done the list, right? I'm, I, I haven't killed people. I haven't done this. I haven't done this. Like, I'm a good dude. Like, we, like to, we love our resume of how good we are. So he brings that to Jesus, and he's like, is there anything else, Jesus? And he's trying to brag a little bit about his list of how good he is. And then Jesus comes back, and in Mark chapter 10, said, Jesus looked at him, and this is an important part that I've read over so many times. Jesus looked looked at him and loved him, looked at him with eyes of love and saw what this guy was missing. He said, one thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. What? Go sell everything you got? I worked hard for that, Jesus? Like, my guy loves the boat. You know what I mean? I can't get rid of it. I love the four-wheeler. I have a great time with it. He said, go sell it all. He said, at that, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This isn't, this isn't Jesus saying, go sell everything, and that's the only way to get to heaven. Jesus just knew in this man's heart what was most important. And so he called it out. Jesus looked at him with love. And he called out that so many things had become great and important that really weren't important. A mark of a real man knows what's important. It's, and it's easy in life to want to think of our manliness or our 
quality of how good of a person that we are by our accomplishments and our wealth and our accumulation of things and the amount of people who like us and likes we have online. All while missing what's most important. If Jesus were to look at your life and say you lack one thing, what's that thing? We gotta know what's most important. And what Jesus was telling him is that you're Deep dependence on God is more important than anything that you've accumulated. Yeah, you've got a great pedigree and you've got a great list of stuff, but yeah, you don't have a relationship. You've done the things. You checked off the box. You came to church. Like, good job, guys. Thank you for coming to church. But it's not about checking off the box and saying, I went to church today. It's about a relationship with the God of heaven. Relationship with him. It's knowing what's important. It's that deep dependence on God is the real true mark of manhood. If we've messed up on any of the rest of these, and I think I've messed up on every one of these at a certain point, you're like, oh gosh, he's really hammering me like I'm a failure. We all are. I'm looking at Jesus as the example, right? We're not there, but if we want to start with one mark of manhood, one example that we can give to everyone else, that everyone else can look at us and say, I want to do that, it's saying, I want to be, have a deep foundational dependence on God. You start there, this one mark of manhood, and we're doing what we need to be doing. It's not about the fart contests, although... That's cool. You ever do that? Roll the windows up and nobody? Okay, Kevin's, nah, I didn't either. Not me. <clears throat> it wasn't me. It's not just about beard quality. BJ, back in the back, it's on point. Like he came in, I'm like, dang, I feel inferior a little bit. That thing's, that thing's great. Those are awesome. But those aren't really the characteristics that Paul's talking about. Those are great things. I love it. But when we see Paul saying, man up or act like a man, he's not telling everyone to do these things. He's saying there's some characteristics of real manhood that we all need to have. Integrity and humility and love, compassion, making time for what's important, living intentional. If we do these things with a deep foundational dependence on God, then I can stand firm no matter what then I can stand firm no matter what. So here's my question as we, as we end out and close out. Does this sound like the man as we've defined it? Not me a lot of times. Does this sound like a true man as you've thought about it before? As you think about the most important thing it takes to be a man, did humility make the list? Probably not, having a bigger bank account than you made it. That's how guys think, right? Doing something better than you. Like, for real, like, I, I don't do anything if I know I'm not somewhat good at it. Like, it's very rare, and I will sometimes, because my kids will ask, will you play foosball with me? No, I'll play air hockey with you, because I make and kick your butt at air hockey, but foosball, I'm horrible. I want to do those things because it makes me like a little more validated, right? But how about humility and integrity and intentionality? Like, how are, how are we doing in those things? Remember, this isn't just a challenge for men. This is, this is, he's saying man up. I want to look at real godly manliness so we can understand the context of what it is. Men, we should be the example in this, but it's something for us all to live. Paul's looking at us and saying, you want a faith that stands? You want a life that stands? Man up. Have courage. Have boldness. Be tough, but in humility and in integrity. Give you, pouring your life into what's important. Making time for what matters. We, we stand bold and courageous and strong in those things. You got a life that stands. Like the, like the last story that we read, you pour your life into everything else and neglect these things, though. We'll be walking away, hanging our head, missing the one thing. I'm just telling you, I know that God's got a life in store for us that stands. We're not weak, 
little people who anything that comes against us, we fall and falter and give up. As believers, we should be the strongest, most stable people in the world. Because it's not about us being stable in ourselves, but we have the Holy Spirit that we're clinging on to. So today, how are you doing? How are you doing? 1 Corinthians 16, 13 in the King James says it this way, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men. Quit like a man. Because the kind of man this is talking about doesn't quit. So as an example to all of us, he's like, whenever life hits, don't quit. When life's hard and you want to give up, don't quit. Sometimes we quit way too early way too soon and God just says keep going depend on me invest your life into what truly matters you can do this there's days that are hard there's days that aren't easy but stand firm in the faith be courageous and be bold you will not be overtaken because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus these are things that describe you as we stand and as we say it's not a sexist or insensitive thing that Paul says or not what he's intending to be as we could read it nowadays he's saying man up let's all have the fortitude to stand no matter what hits and tomorrow something's gonna happen I can just about tell you as you leave church you came into worship something may happen on the way home don't quit, don't give up because the strength that's inside of you is stronger than that's against you and we are called not to just stand but to stand strong and change the world would you stand up with me men how have you defined manhood and what kind of man are you real question for you to search within your heart right now I want everybody to close their eyes just for a moment as we are about to leave what kind of man am I? How am I doing with this list? I've said we all fall in some points. Absolutely. But with Jesus as my example, I'm striving to be all that I can be as a man. Everyone, have I been standing firm? This is for everyone in here. Have you been standing firm with courage or sitting down in some areas that are important? challenge you today, stand, stand, have the courage to stand, to stand firm with a deep dependence on God, to stand firm with the example of Jesus, you will not be overtaken, you will not be defeated, you will not be overcome, because you are more than conquerors, you are more than a conqueror, spiritually you think Rambo's tough, come on, you got him because you're more than conquerors. You think Satan's got anything against you? No, we got God on our side. You can stand and everything else falls because we've got a faith that stands. We're courageous and we're strong and it's based on the strength of God. Jesus, I thank you for all that you've done. Hey, if you're in this place and you've never given your life to Jesus before, I want you to know that Jesus has done everything that it takes for you to have your home in heaven. All we have to do is accept him as our savior, ask forgiveness of our sins. And today's the day you want to be for sure that heaven is your home. Will you just lift your hand up? Come on, if that's you. Maybe you're in this place and you can say, man, I've had bad examples of men before. To hear that phrasing even brings up some memories. But Jesus is our example courage and boldness is our new attribute. You will not be overcome. If there's anybody in here that you're like, it's been tough lately, and I need the courage to still stand, would you just lift your hand up? Men, women, everybody. Yeah. Father, I just pray for everybody in this place, God. Holy Spirit, would you just empower us in the name of Jesus. You said that you give us dudamous power which is explosive power. God, I pray that we walk out of this place with that kind of power in our life, that we just don't give up, but we stand up and we have courage and boldness to do everything you've called us to do. God, I just pray that people who
who left, who come into this place who were discouraged with you knowing, knowing they have the courage and the boldness to do this. I love you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just give God some praise.